Um, each presenter will have 15 minutes to present. Please be thoughtful of the time uh, because we will need to have uh, at least 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. And we have for this panel, we have four presenters. So definitely we need to be thoughtful for time. So we'll we will start with Iman and Denise who are presenting in person and we'll move to uh, the other presenters online after that. Um, the presentation from Iman and Denise are, is access points in the library catalog, a key to discovery, eyes on NACO and SACO programs. Iman is Arabic, Arabic cataloger uh, at UCLA, and um, Denise is the Arabic cataloger, metadata cataloger at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, please, Iman and, and Denise. Thank you, Mohammed. Hello, everyone. As selectors, catalogers, and library acquisition staff, all striving to ensure and facilitate full access to our rich library collections, we are sometimes surprised and somewhat disappointed by low circulation statistics of some collections, which is then maybe followed by weeding decision and revised collection development policies. So our question today is, can we do something to improve discovery? The objective of this presentation is to identify some challenges in accessing libraries' Middle Eastern collections and to propose some ways to overcome the challenges and improve discovery. Some of these challenges are related to bibliographic descriptions, other to subject analysis. Access points are the key by which users can query the system and find what they want or need, or what the library owns. So they need to be carefully established and maintained, and we need to make sure that they are accurate, representative, inclusive, and discoverable. In this presentation, Denise and I will highlight these points. Access points refer to a name, term, code, or phrase representing a specific entity. They enable users to discover entities such as individuals, corporate bodies, families, titles, and subjects associated with a given resource in library collections. These access points are added to the catalog records and provide the users with various ways to discover resources in various languages, format, and subjects. Through authority work, the form of specific access point must be unique and recorded in standardized form in order to maintain consistency and to differentiate similar names from each other. Under the PCC, or the Program for Cooperative Cataloging, NACO members contribute name authority record for agent, places, works, and expression to the name authority uh, file. Under NACO, certain funnels focus on specific types of name, such as the Arabic funnel, the Persian, the, the Armenian funnel. Mm -hmm. Through SACO, members contribute subject headings, genre, term, uh, genre and form terms, demographic grouping terms, and they also contribute to the Library of Congress classification schedules. Contributing to these uh, programs enhance the discovery of our collection. However, materials in certain languages related to the Middle East may have some additional challenges in description and access. And we will try to highlight some of these challenges. Romanization, or the conversion of text from a different writing system, such as Arabic, Urdu, Persian, etc., to Roman script is the metadata. So the metadata may coexist with the rest of the Latin data in our library catalog is one of the main challenges, because it's not always consistent or perfect. There is a lack of consensus, which may cause duplication of records, both in bibliographic records and authority. Users are faced with romanization, with various romanization schemas. Also, the ALALC romanization table that we use in our library has been criticized as ambiguous and complex. And sometimes users get confused or frustrated as they try to read and comprehend the romanized metadata in our library catalog. Romanization also poses some challenges to catalogers as they need to create and maintain certain best practices, add variance title or different romanization form and web record, or more references in authority records. Following certain ALA romanization uh, rules for both Arabic and Persian is not easy. 
and requires some training for both the catalogers and the reference librarians. They also often need to consult different resources or dictionary to check the preferred form. And most importantly, Arabic and Persian languages rely on tashkil or tahrik. Tashkil is often not present on publication, and it requires familiarity with the grammar. Familiarity with the culture is also needed. For a cataloger to catalog the book, Zayim Abaola Kida, on the screen, or for the access staff to find this title, they would need to be familiar with Egyptian dialect. Despite the challenges of romanization, it's still found to be helpful and necessary for discovery of non-Latin materials, especially used for, for libraries that do not have the staff with the language expertise needed to process these materials. The Library of Congress reinitiated its effort to maintain the romanization table. The LC Romanization Review Board follow and maintain revised procedure guidance to facilitate the approval of new and romanization tables. Developing macros and romanization tool between the romanized form and the script can be, also can help in the process. However, adding the script is indispensable for enhancing the discovery. <clears throat> Duplicates, name authority is one of the main issues and challenges affecting the access and discovery of Arabic and Persian li library resources. During the period from October 2022 to September 2023, 106 Arabic and Persian NARS were deleted because of a duplicate merge request submitted to the Library of Congress. Duplicate name authority causes the bibliographic records or work related to one person to be split and accessed under two or more uh, records. And in the few slides, I will try to highlight these problem, problems with some examples. This is a simple situa situation that highlights a different romanization between two catalogers, Asufi and Asufi. The, the 0 10 field at the top of the, uh, the, uh, the slide display the two NARs that have been merged. The second number under subfield Z include the deleted authority record. This is one of the main causes of duplicate NARs, especially when catalogers are not familiar with how a name is pronounced. Javad Mujavi is an Iranian poet and a writer who published mainly in Persian, but because his name also appeared in another English work, two NARs were, were created and later on they had to be merged. In this example, is, uh, in the, is the name of this example Salah Salim Zarnuka or Zartuka? Sometimes the reason of the confusion or duplication issue comes from publication error or misprint. These two NARs need to be merged. And here I would like to acknowledge my colleague, Shelton Henderson and University of Pennsylvania for submitting many of these duplicates problems and for his detective work. Now this is a more complicated example, uh, resulting in quadruplicate with different choices of a first element. Four NARs were created under Wallawi, Ethiopi, Ethiopi, and Ibn Musa. So imagine the mess in, in, the, in the library catalog. In summary, and before creating a new NAR, or using one in your access point, search the resource in hand and in the name authority file well for a different romanization form, different name element, such as in the example of Wallawi, another possible Latin form, especially if the author writes in addition to Arabic or Persian, French in English. And when there's, when there's a found NAR, examine the cited work well in the 670 or all other existing attributes in the record. This can prevent creating duplicate records, ultimately dividing the works under two or more access points. Also, this can prevent using the wrong NAR for similar names. When, you, when you're suspecting a duplicate record or any related issues, contact the Arabic NACO funnel or pose your question in the case of Persian names for the, in the Arabic, uh, uh, and sorry, in the Persian cataloging listserv. And on this note, I will stop to allow my colleague, Denise, to present on another interesting challenge that we encounter when searching for topics related to our materials. Over to you, Denise. Thank you. Five minutes, okay. Uh, thank you, Iman. Um, I'd like to turn now to the SACO program and discuss issues with subject headings and classification um, as they pertain to Middle Eastern resources. 
Um, it's been recognized for decades that LCSH can be limited in certain areas and is biased toward maleness, whiteness, Christianity, and heteronormativity. That there's a strong bias toward the history and culture of the United States is not surprising. However, geographic coverage in subject headings and classification tables is also much stronger for certain areas of the world, such as Western Europe, um, than others, such as Af Africa. Other challenging areas include the lack of expertise among catalogers, which may be due to language or subject matter, um, the complexity of LCSH rules for applying headaches, and the complicated rules for constructing new SACO proposals and the concomitant time and effort. Um, let's take a look at some issues with subject headings and classification, um, along with some proposed solutions. Uh, going, going by the broader terms for these two headings, Shia would be applied to works about the religious group and Shiites would be applied to works about its members. Um, but the presence of um, Imamites as a variant for Shia definitely causes some confusion. She, Shia also has the variant Twelvers, but as you can see from the image taken from classification web, Shia is also a broader term for a number of Shiite groups that are definitely not Twelvers. So the term Shia is being used in two ways, both as a broad category for all Shiite groups and as a narrower term for Imami or Twelver Shiism. Additionally, there are no scope notes, so it's really unclear um, how these headings are supposed to be applied. And this does not even address the dubious term Islamic sects. In the area of Islamic law, there are issues with applying English legal terms to Islamic law resources. This often requires specialized expertise to apply LCSH easily and accurately. Sometimes the journal heading Islamic law is used when the caller doesn't know the corresponding English term for the topic. It would be helpful to have the Arabic term listed as a variant to easily facilitate discovery of the correct subject heading. Um, then there is also the lack of subject headings for different schools of law. To get around this, catalogers usually use Islamic law interpretation and construction and add an additional heading for members of the school, such as Malachites or Hanbalites. This is unsatisfactory since these books are not about the members, but rather about the actual school of law. This slide shows a variety of subject headings for works pertaining to Shiite law. Notice that there is no one subject heading that serves to link them together. We propose that a task group be formed to consider possible subject headings for all the schools of Islamic law. Possible solutions are Islamic law qualified by school or Islamic law subdivided by school. Um, here we have an instance of a topic that is not adequately represented in LCSH. Currently, there is no subject heading that can be used for the topic of national rights in Palestine, um, even though phrases such as Palestine question are commonly found in all types of resources. This topic is subsumed under the headings Jewish-Arab relations and Arab-Israeli conflict. These are problem problematic because although they have the variant Palestine problem, they're too broad and encompass far, too, far more than the national rights in Palestine. Um, the issue came up because the Hebraica funnel had submitted proposals regarding the application of those two subject headings, um, but their proposals did not adequately address the national rights topic. So our solution was to propose a new subject heading for Palestine question. Uh, okay, so I have one minute. Um, so suffice to say that um, we formed a, a working group, and um, you can see the list of the work that we had. Um, the proposal was accepted with the caveat that it be qualified by dates um, and um, that we have uh, some Hebrew variants added. So since I only have a minute, I will just say that in the classification tables we have issues with um, outdated language, which you can see here on the slide. Um, and in August I submitted proposals to have that outdated language changed. Um, so, in summary, um, Iman and I would like to propose that um, possibly the Committee on Cataloging create some sort of um, database whereby MILA members can submit um, problematic subject, subject headings or classifications and, um, and that uh, task groups be created so that we can work together to um, address these issues. So. Thank you very much, and um, we'll be happy to take questions at the end of this. Thank you so much, Iman and Denise, and many thanks for sticking to the time. 
And now we will move to the online presenters um, and we'll take the questions and answers at the end. Hopefully we'll have enough time for all the questions and answers. Now I will uh, introduce the um, second um, presenters of this panel. Uh, Mark Mehlehauser, the director of the Center for Excellence in the Middle East Studies, Middle East and Arab Cultures at the AUC Library, and uh, Omar Salim, a student in the Department of Computer Science in the American University of Cairo, and Rafiq Yaqub is a student of the Department of Computer Science also in the a in AUC, and they will be presenting on collaboration at AUC. Mark, please. Hello, <laughs> can you hear me well? We do. We can hear you very well. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, hello, everyone, and uh, good afternoon from Cairo. Good morning to where you are. Um, thanks uh, for having us today. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, the in essence, the Middle East librarian here at the American University in Cairo. Um, but I'll not be talking about our library or indeed our collections in the first instance. Today, what I'd like to do is um, showcase a collaboration between the library and the Department of Computer Science and Engineering here at the university and two student internship projects that we had this summer. Um, I'd obviously like to, to thank uh, the Computer Science and Engineering Department here. Um, but in the interest of time, um, let me be brief about um, my part of this um, and then turn it over to the students. The purpose of these summer intern internships, which uh, run the past couple of years, um, is really to give uh, to students the opportunity to um, hone their skills and to um, dig their teeth into uh, material provided by the library and to apply their knowledge um, in a practical sense uh, to some problems that we have. And for our end, what we're getting out of it, we're getting some prototypes types of possible workflow uh, improvements that will help us really create wider and a more detailed access to our, uh, to our collections. So the one caveat that I'd like to send um, before uh, the students to take over is that these are really not meant to be finished products. They're meant to be prototypes. <clears throat> so they always have the glitches, they have limitations, so on and so forth. But the idea is really to showcase what is possible um, with current technology, particularly open source uh, software that's out there, um, and what can be built with relatively little effort without having recourse to um, a costly uh, software uh, development. So um, um, I'd like to showcase two projects, one by uh, Omar Haitam Salem and his team, and the other one by uh, Ahmed Hamad and his uh, group. Um, I'd like to invite um, Ahmed uh, to go first and talk to uh, us about their um, project, which is entitled Image Tagging. Um, Ahmed, also known as Congo, go ahead. Yes, and good evening. So our project is named Image Tagging. So if we can go to the next. First thing is the problem. What we were trying to solve, we were given a set of images in the library uh, in the library's database, and we needed to develop a graphic interface that enables an untrained user to be able to tag the individual image, the images by choosing the most suitable tags out of some recommended ones. So we needed to build a recommendation engine or a recommendation model that would check the image provide some rec recommended tags and the user would click these tags and it would automatically be saved into the database. So we decided to develop a, desk a desktop application to run on the computers of the library that would utilize the latest deep learning image tagging models and the uh, image identification models in order to be able to do that. Next, please. So how does our, what does our app do? The application allow the user to first of all will get uh, the user would give the the the, the application an image and then uh, it would generate the uh, tags and it will be chosen by the user then it will be automatically saved in by uh, in Arabic and English on Google Drive for the current time before because we didn't have access to the library's database itself. Next, so what were the tools used before showing you our app? First, we used a PyQt5 uh, toolkit. That's a, a cross-platform GUI toolkit, uh, a set of Python binding, uh, bindings, in order to be able to build a simple yet efficient uh, front end or design, which the user will yeah. see, and also to be able to develop the back end or the, the logistics that goes behind the, the screen. Then we had the deep learning models. We used PyTorch, which is a famous framework in order to be able to use open source frame, uh, models that were uh, available in order to train the, the model with the images available uh, randomly online. 
And finally, the Google Cloud Services, the APIs in order to be able to access the Google Drive, the translating Google Translate APIs and uh, translate the tags. Next. So our app, as you can see, uh, when you open it, you'll find the upload image up on the left. You click it and for example, I selected this image and uh, automatically the tags are generated onto the right. As you can see, it's not quite accurate because it's an open source and I, uh, we're, in, we're not able to train it on specific images itself. And also we used our laptops to train it. We did not have dedicated GPUs in order to be able to train the models. However, it does show promising results such as comic book, toy shop, because these are action figures uh, in toy shops and some also random uh, uh, random tags uh, down below, but that's the, the integration of two models running together and getting the best 15 tags available. And there are no dupl duplicates in this tags. So the user would click an, uh, a tag or two or three, then would click store on the bottom right. Uh, automatically, it gets uploaded to the drive, translated, and the image is stored with its title, the tags in English, and then the tags in Arabic. Uh, next. So this is a help button at the bottom left. In order to explain how you can use our uh, application if, if you face any difficulties, the steps on what you should do. First, click the upload image and it, the complete process is available. In addition, our mails are available uh, just in case if you need to uh, inquire about anything or you need help regarding our application. Also, uh, for the note, uh, it is still uh, it can be uh, made better by allowing the user to select multiple images and then automatically the tags are selected by the model itself, not by the user. However, it would need ded dedicated GPUs, as I said, and also it would need uh, more sophisticated models, not an open source one. Next. This is an image of the Google Drive. So as you can see, the image get up gets uploaded. Then we have a, an Excel sheet in which the image is stored in its title, the tags in English and the tags in Arabic. And that is our application. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, uh, as Ahmed already pointed out, um, there is certain limitation, of course, with the, um, the, the tags I've got here, but this is mainly due to computing limitations. We just cannot uh, train a model on more specific images. Um, but it shows uh, basically a, a workflow that might make it uh, faster to tag large collections of images um, in a fairly short period of time. Um, if we have Omar, uh, could uh, we hand over to him, please, so he can show us their project? Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. okay. Uh, Omar will be talking to us about OCR correction. Omar, go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Omar Hatim, as just uh, Mr. Mark has just said. And our project was concerning about OCR correction. So the next slide. Uh, so what is the problem in general? So digitization is, of course, one of the most important projects that we need to do for uh, library uh, texts as we have a lot of large quantities in Arabic, especially in ancient Arabic that need to be digitized or to be preserved. However, most of the out-of-the-box OCR software that we have usually delivers uh, uneven results and incorrect outputs, especially the older we get. So for example, here's an example, the word as'alukum alayhi. So, uh, here, uh, this was an OCR that we actually tried and it uh, misidentified alayhi as ghalayhi. It, missed, uh, it mistook the first letter. So this is an issue that we wanted to tackle and to make OCR better. So here's our idea. Uh, actually, we cannot immediately make OCR better. We don't have the resources as small libraries or as uh, enough computing power to suddenly make OCR a much better technology. However, what we want to do and our aim of our project was to create a, a process or a, a pipeline that over time will make the OCR at any specific place much better and much more powerful over time. So it is the progression over multiple uh, steps that will hopefully make it maybe in a few, uh, in some time, a good product. So how do we do this? This is our process, our feedback loop. So the first step, of course, is some manual correction. So we will have to be, librarians initially will have to take the OCR outputs, just like the one we saw before, and correct them themselves. And this is the initial uh, stage of this uh, process. You will, uh, librarians will have to take the output of some OCR and then try to correct it. What we then uh, added were two things. First, we added an extra machine learning model. So already we have the OCR engine that has been provided through open source uh, libraries such as Kraken and Tesseract. 
and after that also goes to another uh, artificial intelligence model that tries to correct it as well. So it simply reads the output and tries to guess what's actually the correct thing. And the idea is to take this model and to take the manual corrections that were done uh, by the librarians to train our original OCR models. So the whole day is now the uh, librarian has corrected, it has been corrected again. Now let's teach the OCR, mo uh, OCR model the correct uh, output. And hopefully as we train it more and more and more, becomes a much better model and the need for manual correction will decrease. Okay, thanks. So what our system does was, as we said, three main things. The first thing was the manual correction. Uh, we were advised to make it in sort of a game. So what will happen is that we will take the OCR output that was generated, we will give it to the user and they will have to correct it. And then we try to add a competitive edge by having some scores and some values in the leaderboard in order to make uh, the game much more appealing and much more uh, exciting as you know, the process of correction is, some, uh, is a very tedious task. The second part is at the same time, there will be a model that in itself will try to correct as well. So even if the OCR input is uh, output is bad, we can have another model that itself can again, try to look into the problem and maybe try to solve it as well. So uh, this is our second contribution. And our third one is that the OCR engines in general, the open source one especially, uh, might require a lot of technical expertise to be installed and operational in certain uh, on most uh, devices. But our goal is actually to make it already integrated into one uh, program. So, so in order that its installation and its use in general is not something that requires a lot of experience uh, in technical software. Uh, next. So this is a demo here of uh, the game design we did. So as you can see, you will first be uh, entered with a home screen. So it's the AUC library OCR game. As you can see, it had already a score is 10 was because we actually played the game before and we had a specific score from last time. And what you do every time is just input uh, a, a collection of images, basically your OCR output, you, you have taken and generated it. And then we take that OCR output and start analyzing it and see where the mistakes are. And we do this again using our says our correct model. And then whenever uh, the OCR output has low confidence or that it feels incorrect, we give it to the user in order to correct it. And after this correction is done, uh, this is again fed back into the actual uh, like back end part, the part that's not uh, usually seen by uh, the users, and it will train the model automatically. Omar, okay, I think thanks. you have to uh, conclude in two minutes, so just try to wrap up. Yeah, I'm almost done, so okay. Uh, so just here's a quick idea of the tools we used. So OCR is, uh, our OCR, the open engine we used was Kraken, which was, has been state of the art. It's a little bit difficult to install, but it uh, gives better results. Our post OCR was done in a library called Dynet, which works especially for these type of areas. And our app itself was created using what we call React and Electron, which were designed basically to give a nice, the nice use, user interface you see. So finally, in my last minute, I just want to uh, say the limitations of this idea. So the first thing is in terms of actual speed. So this process will make a uh, correction, especially at the beginning, a lot longer because these models might take about 30 seconds per page, which is a lot slower than the commercial, especially OCR engines. It takes a lot more time. The second thing is that the performance gain, at least initially, will not actually be that high. So it's more of a long-term investment in uh, the correction scheme. Uh, also, the storage of these new data might require that uh, be difficult on some weaker machines. And finally, the installation process, we have not been able to make it uh, very straightforward, and this was one of our findings. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Um, I'd just like to point out that um, the documentation um, for these projects, including the link to the GitHub repository, um, is on our webpage on library.aucegypt.edu under subject guides. You'll find the computer science guide, and there we've got the uh, summary in terms where all the documentation is provided. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, Omar, and Rafiq for the great presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> now we move to the, um, the third presenters uh, in this panel. Um, with the presentation title, Reimagine uh, Re Descriptive Workflow, a vision for inclusive descriptive practices, uh, will, be done, will be presented by Merrily Prophet, the Senior Manager of, for the OCLC uh, Research Library uh, Partnership, and uh, Jay Holly uh, Way, the Director of the End User Platform Services within the Global Product Management uh, Division at OCLC. Merrily and Jay, please do. 
And I am starting my stopwatch here so I can keep a time on kept keep track of the time. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for inviting myself and Jay on behalf of OCLC. We're very happy to be here today to talk about this project and its impacts. And I want to start right up front with the thank yous uh, instead of leaving these for the end. So first of all, thanks to the Mellon Foundation, which funded this project. Um, uh, but also big thanks to OCLC, uh, whose contribution far exceeded that of the Mellon Foundation and continues uh, beyond the project to this day. Um, and then finally, thanks to the OCLC Research Library Partnership. This is the organization that I work for. Many of you are from OCLC RLP institutions, and we really want to thank you for your inspiration for helping us to carry this project forward. Um, I also want to thank um, our advisory board, uh, very uh, important at the heart of this project was our advisory board, who are really essential in helping us to uh, meet our goals and also to keep track of our outputs. Um, so what is the Reimagined Descriptive Workflows project. This was a project that convened experts, practitioners, and community members for a three-day convening in 2021 to determine ways of improving descriptive practices, tools, infrastructures, workflows in libraries and archives pertaining to descriptive practices. The resulting community agenda, which was published last year, draws together insights from this convening as well as related research and then uh, examples from work that's ongoing in the field. So the agenda is very much not a how-to guide, but is instead instructed to in instruct and chart a path forward towards reparative, inclusive, and anti-racist description. The agenda is divided into two distinct parts. The first part is contextual information or how we did the project and the method that we use to create the agenda. Um, it includes details about how we undertook our virtual convening, including elements of mood, of food, music, um, and culture, yes, during a pandemic uh, in a virtual convening. Um, those can all be found in our report. We've also taken the time to document what we felt like were design principles that helped us to support a productive meeting. As well, it frames historical, local, and workflow challenges and tensions to consider when approaching inclusive and reparative metadata work. The second part of the agenda is a framework of guidance that suggests actions and exercises that can help frame institutions, local priorities, and areas for change, and also provides those examples from the field. So it is our belief that all institutions hold power to make meaningful change in this space and that all uh, share collective responsibility. So not just catalogers, um, but everyone within its institution needs to get behind this effort. So the motivation for this work is really rooted in the fact that descriptive practices have been harmful for some time. Um, this is summarized in the catalogers code of ethics, which was published in 2021. And I'm quoting, cataloging standards and practices are currently and historically characterized by racism, white supremacy, colonialism, othering, and oppression. And this is also summarized nicely in the Canadian Federation of Library Association report, which I'm including today, the meeting uh, that we're attending virtually is based in Canada. Um, but this report was part of uh, Canada's truth and reconciliation process um, in uh, uh, offering repair to um, uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people of Canada, but I think also uh, echoes what we're reading elsewhere, that we first need to acknowledge and that harms have happened before we can engage around repair. So despite many wonderful efforts, it remains true that the Library and Archives Perfection has a reparative descriptive debt, which represents an enormous backlog for us to address today. Um, so I want to talk also about a little bit of work that we did before the project uh, got going. In 2017, the OCLC RLP, Research Library Partnership, 
uh, conducted a survey to explore if and how we were moving forward with work around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And this is just a snapshot of survey results that helped to document and illuminate something that we already anecdotally knew, that institutions were really struggling with creating inclusive and anti-racist descriptions. Um, and this need for dealing with racist and inappropriate metadata had become a steady drumbeat, which was really driving discussions in the OCLC Research Library Partnerships Metadata Managers Focus Group. Um, as a precursor to the RDW project, we followed up um, to increase our understanding of the challenges that were faced by librarians in the space. Um, and we conducted a series of semi-structured interviews on the difficulty of cataloging topics related to indigenous peoples. So we took a really focused um, approach in these interviews. Uh, these conversations took place between March and June 2020, right at the beginning of the um, uh, global pandemic. Um, and these interviews helped us to further characterize the problem, not only identifying structural barriers, but also I think really importantly, the harms caused by not doing the work. So what are the impacts of patrons reach, reading these and trying to use and grapple with these really inappropriate subject headings. So these two pieces of work, the survey and these interviews really helped us to set the stage for the Reimagined Descriptive Workflows project. So as I said, this report is not a how-to manual for repairing description, rather it outlines the why of the problem space and then suggests tactics for moving the way forward. So part of this is outlining these tensions that are inherent in anti-racist work, and also it makes the case for why this work is needed. Um, the report also identifies key concepts that are necessary in anti-racist work. So white supremacy, the role of power holding institutions, the need to relinquish power and building trust among communities. Finally, the report presents a framework of guidance which can be used within all levels of an organization from leadership to middle management to individual contributors. Um, the framework of guidance is as close to a checklist as the report comes and readers can ask themselves which of these conditions are true for me at my institution and where is growth and learning still needed. Um, so now you've heard some background information, what influenced the work, who contributed to it, and we've presented the publication framework. So now we're going to look at some concrete outcomes, and I'm going to uh, ask Jay Holloway to speak to some of the outcomes that we've been able to see within OCLC. Great. Thank you, Marilee. And hello, everyone. Thanks for having us today. My name is Jay Holloway, and I work with uh, WorldCat Discovery here at OCLC. Um, so today we're going to walk through what this functionality is, where it came from, and uh, then describe kind of what's next for it. Um, so I got to be a part of the Reimagined Descriptive Workflows working sessions that Mary Lee mentioned during the uh, pandemic. And uh, a few takeaways I had from that were one, that we need to figure out approaches that are uh, quick and ra rapidly reduce harm for users, while the broader library ecosystem figures out challenging aspects of this, such as workflows, community of practice, and other things that need uh, solved that will not be quick win solutions. And the second was that of multiplicity, um, that with Global solutions, uh, WorldCat Discovery works across many different uh, cultures and regions across the globe. Um, we need culturally contextual solutions, not one size fits all, which is really at tension, at odds with a lot of our efforts to scale software data, make it reusable and repeatable as much as possible. And in an effort to reduce complexity and maintenance, we actually, in many cases, need to ensure that we have localized configurable solutions for uh, our library communities to best reflect their cultural values and needs. Next slide. Um, so where are we starting from with WorldCat is with uh, a continuously updated and scalable infrastructure. So where and where controlled vocabularies work, where do they where they do not encounter multiplicity issues, they scale at the pace of change. Um, and ha have an example here that with an LCS LCSH change, we are able to rapidly make a change within a couple weeks uh, to some terms that had been long advocated for by the library community. Once they were changed, the change themselves were very rapid within WorldCat. And then we're also available for local catalogs. Um, on the next slide. 
So what does that model look like today? We have global data um, starting from the left that leverages controlled vocabularies, and that brings with it the benefits of scale. To the, uh, next, we have local bibliographic data, um, which then uh, further enriches the global data. And all, both of these data sets are kind of what you see is what you get. What you put into the system is exactly what the library user sees. So to look at an example of that, uh, for, in this example, I'm, I'm just using homeless persons as an example. Um, it's not a perfect example, and there are um, areas where this may not make sense for uh, your communities. Uh, but to take it as a controlled heading example, homeless persons, um, if I search that, exactly what I see in the search results is also homeless persons. So there's no change to the vocabulary. That is the controlled heading. Even if I add local bibliographic data, I'm still going to see the global data. And then in addition to that, I would see the local bibliographic data. Um, it's never replaced. So the key question then is, next slide. How can we update language for the user to reduce harm caused by these one size fits all controlled vocabularies without losing the benefit of the scale that the controlled vocabularies offer? So I think there was an example earlier searching for an, a controlled name. We want to we expect to see everything from that name. If we start splintering it into different names, then we'll never find all of the content that that author has available to them. On to the next slide. So um, our solution here is to extend the world cap model to replace it with local terms so we still have the global data using controlled vocabularies we still have the local data that can further enrich the global data but before we display this to the user we use your local configuration files to put locally preferred language in front of the global and local terms so we make the replacement and then display it to the user so let's take a look at that um, so in this example, I searched homeless persons, but my library has actually replaced that term with people experiencing homelessness to practice people first language to see if that's something that resonates with my community. So I make that configuration change and there I see in the search results people experiencing homelessness, even though the underlying data is homeless persons. So I searched for and got the results back because we indexed homeless persons. So uh, how does this work? Um, so it starts with a, a configuration file. Um, so we have a configuration file available for you to uh, use, share, and collaborate. You make the mapping from um, the controlled term into your locally preferred term. And it's a Google Doc, so you can grab a copy of it, make any changes you want, um, and you can contribute back so that if people are in a similar region or working in a similar space as you, they can see what type of work that you've done to inspire them to uh, perhaps contribute ex uh, their work as well. Jay, so have, after this Jay, configuration file Jay, is you uploaded, have two minutes. Uh, you can... Oh. You, have, you have two minutes. We need to wrap up, please. Great, thank you. Um, then the user sees the terms replaced. Um, if I click on the subject heading, uh, go on, then we display a message to the user to warn them of the harmful language. And that is available now, and it's configurable by the library per discovery instance. Um, we're also doing some additional phase two work to make it so that <clears throat> you can also search the term replacements. If we just want to hop through to that one, uh, phase two. So that when I click on the subject heading, if I click onto that, the next slide, um, then I actually see the terms that were replaced in the search box. I see the terms in the search results, and the underlying data is still homeless persons. So this controlled vocabulary is still used, but you can completely mask it from the search interface. And with that, I hand it back to you, Marilee. Um so just to quickly wrap up, uh, so Jay has shared how the project has impacted OCLC. Um, we were also pleased to see that uh, the report was cited in an article, Challenging Legacies at the British Library. Um, this ar article documents a pilot project that has resulted from recommendations made by a cataloging and metadata subgroup at the British Library. Um, and the focus of this project is on South Asian and Caribbean collections, which represent opportunities to work with heterogeneous material types of importance to the UK and beyond. Um, and uh, what was really great about this, from my perspective, is that the RDW report was used to benchmark the scope of activities um, in organizational shifts, operational workflows, and personal and professional developments. 
The report was also cited as a through line in the IFLA satellite conference uh, that was bringing together the rare books and special collection section with the indigenous matters section. Um, and uh, was, was cited by several presenters and also provided a through line for discussion. Um, and one of the uh, kind of key moments from this conference that was noted by a colleague who attended this was this uh, theme of think of disruption as caring, um, which I really liked. Um, we also uh, very uh, undertook a project, I'll, I'll share links about this, to look at um, collection development and how people are trying to create more diverse collections. Um, and with that, I think we'll just uh, wrap up and I'll share the slides with everybody um, uh, afterwards so that you can look at this in more detail. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Merrily and Jay. And last but not least, we have uh, the presentation from Ismail Hakimi, uh, the um, the librarian by in, in Marriott Library, University of Utah, um, and he will be speaking about barriers to access of Middle East materials. Ismail, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Do you hear me? Do you see my presentation? Yes. Yes, we do. OK, thank you for having me. I will keep my presentation short and brief. <clears throat> my name is Ismail Hakimi. Uh, I'm Middle East Collection Liaison at Marriott Library, University of Utah. My presentation is about barriers to accessing Middle East materials. Uh, these barriers are categorized as political, policy, legislative, and religious, financial, logistical, and technological, professional and work-related, and selector's role in collection development. Many libraries face barriers collecting materials from the Middle East, a region stretching across North Africa and eastward into Central Asia and Pakistan. It can be su surprisingly difficult to purchase books published outside of Canada, the United States, and Europe. My focus here is on barriers that make Middle Eastern materials inaccessible to Western libraries. These barriers may differ from those that people face in the Middle East itself. The biggest barrier to obtaining Persian books is American sanctions on Iran. Our library must order books that are shipped from Iran to France through French company Kemco Sorrel. The French company then ships the books to their Atlanta office. Kemco Sorrel, Sorrel own, owns one of the best suppliers of Persian books called Iran Farhang. The payment line on our acquisition order cannot mention Iran Farhang and must online only mention Kemco Sorrel. The company had an issue with its credit card payment processors. For several months, they couldn't accept credit card payments for customers because their payment processing company dropped them due to the nature of their business. As a result of strict legislation dating back to Saddam Hussein era, publication created in Iraq cannot be exported unless five ministries clearance is obtained, among other requirements. The authorities of Afghanistan threw away tens of thousands of books into the Hillman River. They included works of literature, poetry, history, philosophy, and a sacred Shia text called Nahjul Balaga. 
One of the few Hazara publishers, Ibrahim Shariati, publishes their books in Iran and imports them to Afghanistan. Access to the materials is also hampered by some legislative provisions, governmental authorities, and library policies. Selectors must order books that they see on websites or in the vendors list sent to them by the vendors. They don't have the opportunity to go to the region, to the Middle East, Middle East region, and browse the shelves in the bookstores or book fairs. For many years, our library facilitated frequent, frequent buying trips to the Middle East, but this was paused due to tightening of campus and library accounting regulations. After a long hiatus, we have resumed overseas buying trips, initially with already funded faculty travel, and hope to resume librarian buying trips in the near future. Melo, Middle East Librarians Association, urged libraries to preserve funding for international trips for collection development and networking, to acquire, to acquire books, journals, videos, sound recordings, and ephemeral materials, and for the development of a strategic partnership, furthering collection access through potential digitization projects. The preference of electronic format is another barrier to acquiring materials from the Middle East countries. Library budget have been further squeezed by expensive electronic journal and ebook purchases and subscriptions. The issues faced in academic libraries include retirements, outsourcing, insufficient staffing, loss of institutional memory, funding, state, federal, grant, and donations. Lack and loss of language skills. Infrastructure in the Middle East. Shipping delays, increased mailing costs, issues with loaning materials across borders, not allowing materials to be loaned due to fragility, rarity, and item not on shelf. Lack of required publication information. Publishers in Arabic, Persian, Hebrew language text often do not designate a 10-digit or 13-digit ISP number. Selector role, selector's role in collection development. Bias and diversity as well as selection and censorship play a role when selectors shape the collections, which sometimes prevent accessing to the desired materials. Selectors are connectors between the patrons and the information or resources. They are not arbiters of information, merely providers. Their bias and censorship should not be involved in the process. It is highly likely that sources about minorities and marginalized groups of all kinds, including those based on religion, ethnicity, gender, and nationality will be overlooked, whether on purpose or accidentally. Selectors should try to assemble a comprehensive and diverse collection that includes materials for all kinds of users and covers every aspects of the targeted subject matter or local population. Removing barriers means in inclusive collection development and a fresh perspective. Library collections in the West can be influenced by the expert and their funding resources. For example, the University of Utah Middle East Collection had numerous purchasing trips to Egypt. As a result, 
our collections of Egyptian materials are strong. Our Dr. Aziz Atia collection houses over 194,000 physical items, including 154,000 books, 37,000 journal issues, 165 master theses, and 169 PhD theses. There are significant gaps in our collections also that must be filled with regard to minorities and marginalized group. For instance, our library needs to gather additional materials on ethnic materials, minorities, sorry. Like the Baluch people in the area, the Droz people in Lebanon and Syria, the, the Barbers in Algeria, the Hazaras in Afghanistan, and the Yazidis in Iraq. Inclusive collection development also requires proactively seeking out resources, book lists, and collection development materials that represent the interests of minority groups of the community and the marginalized and less recognized peoples. Collections are shaped by li librarians and staff members who serve as selectors. They can, they can influence the scope of collection, reduce bias, increase holdings, and acknowledge barriers and limitations in the collection. As a recent immigrant to the United States, I, I feel it is more important than ever to document and cover and highlight the changing religious, political, cultural, ethnic, economic, and societal landscape of greater Middle East. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ismail, and everyone presented. And yay, we have 15 minutes for questions and answers. So this is great. We made it, guys. So um, uh, in in this case, I will open the, the questions to uh, everyone here in person and online. Um, if you can, please unmute yourself and speak up, uh, ask your question, or add the question to the chat. And we have here moderators to look at the chat and see what we get. Um, do we have any questions to chat? Um, yes, we've got something in the Q&A. Great. Um, the question uh, is, many libraries who have specialist catalogers are relying on 520 note uh, in the bib breaker to know what Arabic and Persian books are about. Many of these uh, 520 notes are so vague or wrong. Uh, the same can be said for the subject headings. Uh, has anyone here with language expertise considering improving these 520 notes before sending to backlog? I think this goes to probably all the presenters in this um, panel, or probably Denise and Iman can start if you have anything to say. You need to, uh, you have the mic here. I mean, 520, it's a note, it's an optional note. Uh, it's more, it takes more time from cataloger to add it. So it's, it's a free text. Uh, usually for, 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 for me personally, I, always, I would use the 520 point, uh, 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 note uh, to add a citation, like from a publisher. Uh, from publisher website, uh, abstract, especially if it's a uh, fiction, uh, novel Arabic, uh, but that's that's the only way I use uh, 520, but I'm not aware of any other uh, practices. Denise. Okay, thank you, Iman. Uh, I hope this was um, an answer for the question, but if other uh, of the panelists can add up to that anything, please do. Hello, this is this is Amal Morsi. I'm uh, concerning the um, uh, uh, 520 note. Uh, 
it is um, important for two, two reasons, uh, for or, or two uh, ways. For new books, uh, especially the on um, online the books that uh, send sent by as a PDF, um, uh, me as a cataloger rely on it to um, understand what is the book uh, about, and uh, 520 notes is um, should have the citation uh, to uh, to, uh, to tell you where is this. Uh, information came from. It's yes, it is free text, but uh, it should come from reliable uh, resources. Uh, the second uh, 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 way we are relying on 520 notes is um, um, rare materials because it's, it's very important to, to understand what is uh, the uh, resource uh, saying or the summary of it. Um, and also it has to be uh, cited uh, either by the cataloger or um, by uh, the, um, the person we, we bought the rare materials from. Um, um, this is uh, in, in, uh, it's in for the cataloger. It's, uh, 520 is very important. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we have uh, an ad up here. Oh, we have a, we have the mic here. Oh, yeah, I, I just I just wanted to add that 520. The summary note, as Iman said, is optional for adult books, but uh, for ki kids' books and audiovisual materials is almost recommended. Uh, and usually, you can find 520 on all of those, <clears throat> all of those records for kids and for audiovisuals. Ryan, we have two questions. Uh, Ryan and. Hi, uh, thank you. My question was for Mark, Ahmed, and Omar about the collaborative project at AUC. I was just wondering um, which collections you're planning on using the, the tagging, uh, the image tagging uh, method for, and, and also the OCR. Are there other collections you have in mind when you, when you started out this pilot program or not? Thank you. Right, um, if I can answer that real quick. Um, we um, did not have a particular collection in mind. Obviously, we've got very large um, collections of photographs, but um, we, I, I just provided the students with a, sort of a, a, a sample a collection of digitized images uh, of, of newspapers um, uh, and of a printed book in particular that came out of the ACO digitization workflow um, with NYU. Um, but um, the, the intent was just uh, really to explore what was possible without a particular target in mind. And by the way, in the chat, I put the link um, to the GitHub repositories. Um, so you can always go back and um, take a look at that code if you're interested. Thank you. Yes. So I have a get, get to the mic, please. Please say your name. Hi, everybody. My name is Belsam Haddad from American Islamic College. So my question is, what's the difference between two fields, 520 and 541 for cataloger? This is my question. So we have a, uh, a good number of catalogers here can answer that, if possible. 541. I yeah, 541, sure because uh, it, they mentioned used. for manuscripts before. Ah, for manuscripts. Yes. So, Aisha? Uh, I think Denise has, Denise has an answer here. She can say something. So, um, the 541 um, is for, um, for where, you, where the item was acquired. So you use that for like manuscripts. You're not going to use that for um, published material. Your 520 is a summary, um, which could could be used for any almost any kind of material. So it should be used for both or just for published material? Because the manuscript is not published material. Yeah, it, you yeah. can use a 520 for a manuscript, and ideally you should. Oh, OK. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions online? Yes. Uh, go ahead. Yes, please. Hi. 
Um, I'm Matthew Barber. I'm coming from the Institute for Muslim Civilizations, and I'm at the Center for Digital Humanities there. So I have a question for the AUC team working with computer scientists. Um, the first is, I'm intrigued with the image tagging. If um, bias in the models you are using, especially because they're open source models trained um, often on material that's probably English language or specifically outside of the regions in which we work, and if that bias is a problem for this kind of automated image tagging. Uh, the second is, have you used Google Colab to overcome some of these uh, hardware difficulties that you're encountering? Because that might allow you to get access to GPUs and such like to do these kind of work, this kind of work. But maybe you've considered it. Right. Um, so with regard to the quality of the, uh, the image tagging, where as you could see in the example there, the quality of um, the output was really rather low. Um, and many of the tags that the system suggests are really very far off the mark. Um, part of the reason was that it was just a, a thing that came out of the box, um, as, you, as you suggest. And I would think and would hope that if one had a local image set where one could train on and locally curated images, that would really improve the, uh, the, uh, the, the results considerably. It's just, uh, as, as, as they noted, they didn't have the computing power to run it because they, they did it on their local uh, laptop and so on. Um, Google Colabs, um, no, they did not use it. And in, in fact, um, I had asked them not to specifically for the particular reason that the idea was to create something that um, would be really accessible to um, library staff many of whom really are not very techy at all um, and who need something that's sort of um, uh, like, like a GUI, basically, something like that, that looks a bit like um, Mark Edit. Um, so that's, uh, I think, as far as uh, library staff will go, I guess, <laughs> in terms of their, 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 their tech exposure. Um, so that was the reason. But I mean, yes, you, you're right. Of course, if they used Colab, they would have totally different um, means at their disposal. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we have a question uh, from Hora Dayton um, for the uh, for Emil, uh, for Denise and um, and Iman uh, about. Could you tell us more well, about? I think this is actually for Aisha. Oh, that's right. She asked it yes. earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. For for Aisha, the uh, for the MSZ collection. That's right. Yeah, not probably not this present panel, but before the previous panel. Go ahead, Aisha. It's about. Um, can you tell us about the challenges you are facing with MSZ? materials and collections probably cataloging too? Uh, yeah, during the, uh, my experience uh, uh, cataloging the Amazir uh, using the script, because I used the Tifinar script. Um, at the beginning when I started uh, uh, <clears throat> typing the Amazir alphabet, the Tifinar, it was really uh, the, in the connection. It wouldn't take that. Uh, it just messes up the whole script. <clears throat> and then I couldn't figure out what the uh, how to fix that problem, so I had to reach to um, uh, a cataloger in Yale, uh, uh, Chuck. So uh, apparently, it just I had to change something in the font. Um, I can't remember which font, like the style that I used. So and that fixed it a problem. So now I'm able to. Uh, <clears throat> use the Tifinar and can incorporate it in the uh, record, you know, s connection. Yeah, but reading the script, as long as you can read the script, the Tifinar, that shouldn't, you know, so just know when the script, yeah, exactly. The challenge is mainly reading the script. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I hope it, I answered the question, Huda. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question uh, to any of the presenters. If anyone here or online has a question, please ask. Um, if not, I will. Uh, there is a. Oh yeah, here you go. We. Oh, that is thanking everyone. That's great. Uh, the the uh, the question I have in mind is uh, probably for. It goes, I think, all across all the presentations about the idea of change. It is, uh, it is indeed difficult and it needs a lot of persistence to really get to um, make a change happen. Um, so I was at least wondering for one of the examples that Denise and Iman shared is changing specific subject headings to uh, others. Um, how that is difficult in terms of really making that change from the idea in your mind to be the new term that is used in Library of Congress subject heading. 
uh, and the classification goes in the same way as well. Um, so you can you can speak about that if you can just give a few words about it. Um, I'll just say, Mohammed, it's difficult. And it depends on the term that you're trying to change or that you're trying to, pro a new one that you're trying to propose. Um, so, so some of them are, are pretty straightforward and, and easy, but um, something like Palestine question or dealing with some of the examples that I put up there um, can be very difficult and time consuming. And um, one of the big problems is um, expertise. So, so like I might recognize that something is, is, doesn't look right, needs to be changed, um, but I might not have the expertise to do that. Um, one example that's been on my mind for quite a while that I need to get some people together to work with me um, is that the Ottoman Empire is not a, a subject, a geographic subject heading, it's a, a variant under a subject heading that begins with Turkey. And, um, and this is just plain wrong, um, even by uh, LC's own rules about how you do geographic subject headings. Um, but I think in order to make that change, we, we need, um, need to look at Turkish resources. I don't know Turkish, so I, I need to find you know, some people who could help me with this. Um, so that, that would just be one of, of many examples. I'm glad you, in your in your presentation you said that you have a, a working group that can share expertise in these cases. I think. Um, well, well, actually, what I was saying is that that it would be it would be good to kind of like form these working groups. So, like when we did Palestine question, um, Iman formed a working group, uh, seven catalogers, um, two of whom were from um, Arab countries so that we could, we could talk about like, well, what do we want the subject heading to be the authorized access point, talking about all the variants we wanted to have, going through and justifying it all. Um, and it was, it was quite time consuming, but it was very fruitful and very helpful to get all the different points of view and, and different expertise. That is great, and I hope the working groups could include other than librarians, just um, people, researchers, yes. faculty, people with, with more expertise in that. Yes, I would, I would like that very much, actually. Because um, yeah. as long as we have somebody who knows how to do the proposal, that we, we need at least that. And then if we can bring in other people who can, who can do research and, and help out with that, that would be great. This is Iman, who wants to add yeah. something. I, ha I would like to, to add something to what Denise said. Uh, SECO proposal takes time and it takes efforts. And you need literary warrant. Uh, in order uh, to, to submit either a proposal, a new proposal uh, for subject headings or to change a proposal. Uh, but there's also another alternative that, that sometimes I use and it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, and it's allowed, it's to use a Wikidata item either in, in any of the access points and also mm -hmm. the subject headings. So if you have one term that you think it really describes what you have, you can add it in your uh, 650 or any of the 6XX fields. And, uh, so this could be 655? It could be anything. OK. If, but at, it, at, at, it, as long as it has a Wikidata item. So if it has a Wikipedia item, a Wikipedia article, it should have a Wikidata item. And you could add this at the zero, uh, I think, subfield zero, and then add the link to the Wikidata. And that could allow some access. Uh, this is not a controlled vocabulary. You know, Wiki, Wikidata changes. But it's, uh, it, it can provide a good access. And, and Wiki, Wikidata is being improving a lot. So it's another, another source for catalogers. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone, for the presenters. And uh, let's give them a, another round of applause for everyone. And now it is the time for lunch. Please go ahead and serve yourself. <laughs>